problem with Pakistan is that we are a nation of firsts but no seconds. You know, first woman prime minister, Muslim countries, Muslim, the entire Muslim Ummah. The first woman has been elected as the speaker of the parliament now. The first woman pilot, the first woman general in the army, the first this, the, that, and the other, you know, uh, uh, first woman cricketer. The first. We've had so many firsts. I'm sorry. It is a nation of 170 million people, 48% of whom are women living in abject deprivation and horrific living conditions. Who is thinking of them? That's Tahira Abdullah, and this is Alternative Radio. I'm David Barsamian. This edition of AR features Tahira Abdullah on Pakistani women. According to the highly regarded Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, the human rights situation for women in that country is grim. The assassination of former Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto while she was campaigning in late December 2007 captured world headlines, but violence against women continued unchecked throughout the country. The murder of Zila Huma Usman, Minister for Women's Development in Punjab province by a religious zealot, was another high-profile example of women's insecurity. But the killing of prominent women masks the thousands of acts of violence carried out in silence and where men often go unpunished. Women are vulnerable and lack power, particularly in rural areas, where they are the targets of acid attacks, burning, rape, and honor killings. In a strongly patriarchal culture, women's voices are generally muted, but some Pakistani women are fighting back. To talk about these issues is Tahira Abdullah, She's a prominent women's rights activist and development worker based in Islamabad. I talked with Tahira Abdullah in Islamabad in April 2008. Note that since our conversation, General Pervez Musharraf, facing imminent impeachment, resigned as president of Pakistan. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to know about uh, the status of women in Pakistan, and it's, it's such a gigantic subject. But in, in general, uh, how would you define the major obstacles uh, facing women? When we talk about the women of Pakistan, there is a need to disaggregate uh, the subject. Um, first of all, a few overall statistics, which I think it's important for your audience to perhaps know. All over the world, women outnumber men by about 2%, so, so uh, 2 to 4%. So generally in the world population, we see gender disaggregation in the sense that women are 52% and uh, men are generally 48% of the population. But in South Asia, it's different. And this is not just true for Pakistan, it's true for India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and to, to a lesser extent, Sri Lanka, because the, as you know, the literacy rate is higher in Sri Lanka. In Pakistan, there are 48% women and 52% men. The sex ratio is 108 to 100. 108 males to 100 females. It's improved a little bit from 111 to 100, which was in the previous census. Having said that, that the status of women in Pakistan differs by geography also. So urban women are very different from rural women. Rural women are different in each province, so we have to disaggregate by province, and we have to then finally disaggregate by economic class. In urban areas, women live in shanty towns, in squatter slum settlements, uh, illegal, you know, sort of catchment areas, etc. Squalid conditions, no water, no gas, no electricity, no water, no sewerage systems, no roads, no drainage, uh, no livelihoods, no schools, no health, uh, no food, no clothes, no shelter other than, you know, whatever little makeshift plastic or cardboard that they put up, which every time there's a storm or monsoon season or whatever goes. And then there are the, the defense uh, uh, housing authorities, the societies, the, the, the 
you know, the little local groups of, of pockets of elitism where you, you might think that you were in, in, in the most affluent part of California. It's unbelievable the gap which is growing between the haves and the have-nots. I fear for my country. I fear this is not just an issue of gender. It's not just male and female. It is a class issue. It is an economic issue. It is a deprivation issue and it is a poverty issue. But if we are going to talk about poverty, you asked me to tell you about the status of women. I, I, I know we, we should probably go into the legal framework and the religious framework. But just, just to stay on the topic of uh, the economic topic for a, for a minute, if I may be allowed, did you know that there is a lot of controversy and conflict between the previous government? So the government prior to the general elections of 2008, which is General Parvez Musharraf and his king's party, there was a total conflict and controversy raging for the past three years on the issue of poverty data. They have fudged the figures and they said that in their five years tenure of the King's Party's rule, which is the PMLQ party, they brought down poverty from 33% to 23%, almost 10 percentage points. Now, independent economists who are world-renowned say that that is not true and that poverty has risen to about 35%. And I am saddened to inform you that there is total unanimity between the former government, you know, the PMLQ government, General Parvez Musharraf's King's Party, and the op all the opposition parties, and the independent economists, and the women's rights activists. Everybody agrees that for every four Pakistanis, three are women in absolute poverty. For every four poor Pakistanis, three are women. The Minister for Women's Development has self-accepted this in the previous tenure. Right now, all the opposition parties are agreed. You know, the, we read all the election manifestos. We are agreed that women are the worst sufferers under poverty. Now, to come to what, they're, what kind of work they do that, that keeps them in this poverty, the worst aspect is that the government refuses to recognize women's contribution to the economy. This is what bothers me a lot. It bothers a lot of people like me. What bothers us is that women tend through deprivation and poverty of opportunity, not because of their own wanting, women tend not to work in the formal sector of the economy or in the organized, recognized formal labor force. So the government figures, the labor force surveys that come out annually, show, they used to show 9% women of Pakistan working. In the 1981 census, this is, don't laugh, it, it sounds ridiculous, in an agriculture, primarily agrarian country, the 1981 census showed 176 women agriculture workers. Can you believe it? We later found out what that figure was. It was 176 women working in the Ministry of Agriculture. <laughs> and, you know, the rest of the 70% of Pakistani women who live in the rural areas mm -hmm. and who all of them work, 99% work, uh, were uncounted and invisible to the government of Pakistan. So here, the recommendation that women's groups and the demand from the women's groups, women's rights groups has been to count the labor of women in the informal economy, which includes agriculture, home-based work, which is exploited by middlemen and in industries, home-based industrial workers, uh, agricultural workers, and all the domestic workers, and you know, the bonded labor, the, the construction workers, the, the, kiln, the kiln workers, all these kinds of people must be counted in the formal economy. Not only do they contribute to the economy, but they contribute to the gross domestic product. If all the women who work in the non-formal sector of the economy were to go on strike for one week, I swear to you, I promise that Pakistan's economy would come to a grinding halt. What are the literacy rates? Very bad for women. Double. The female illiteracy rate is double that of men. And the only reason it becomes a little better is that young girls are thankfully being enrolled in school in the urban areas still. We have 60... 68% of our population lives in rural areas. The access to schools for little girls in the rural areas is very poor. And that, for that, we have to blame segregation, you know, the tradition of burqa, the, the veiling issue, 
the seclusion, segregation, and lack of mobility of women and girls contributes to the low enrollment rates, as well as the lack of access to schools within the vicinity of the village. What about the law and women's rights? Uh, during the military dictatorship of Zia al-Haq from 1977 to 1988, when the United States was strongly supporting uh, him and his rule here, uh, he passed uh, a series of what are, what are called hudud ordinances. Uh, what are these? I will talk about the hudud ordinances in a minute. I'd just like to add to the information that you have just given about General Ziaul Haq's military dictatorship from 77 to 88, and, and the United States was strongly supporting him, was because they looked upon Pakistan the United States government then looked upon Pakistan as a frontline state in its fight with then communist, you know, the USSR. We had 3.5 million Afghan refugees in Pakistan and, of course, 2.5 million in Iran. A lot of them are still in Pakistan. So please keep that somewhere at the back of your mind. If we have time, we can go back to this issue. It's a fascinating topic. I, I'd love to speak a little bit more about what that has done to the Pakistani population and the Pakistani psyche and how that has contributed to the rising Talibanization now, post 9-11. You know, we have to make the linkages between uh, the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979 and what it has done to the growth of Talibanization in Pakistan when it is now again a frontline state against the, 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 the Talibans and the war, so-called war on terror in quotation marks because we in Pakistan are now beginning to call it the war of terror on Pakistan rather than Pakistan's participation in Mr. Bush's war so-called on terror. I, I need to be very clear whether it's on or off. For us it's off terror, on us. I will go back to General Ziaul Haq who came into power through a coup d'etat he overthrew the elected government of Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. He subsequently executed him by hanging in April of 1979 and became a total autocratic despot uh, with a hand-picked Majlis Ashura, which is an advi advisory parliament, you know, a, a rubber stamp sort of parliament. It, it was a joke. No one took it seriously at all. He did not have a constituency other than the military top brass, okay? He needed to remain, he wanted to remain in power he held a false sham referendum in 1984. And the wording, the phrase, phraseology of that referendum is fascinating. Are you Muslims? Yes. We have, as you know, we have just about uh, uh, under 10% minorities in Pakistan, religious minorities. It, some even say 5%. When he asked this question in the referendum, are you Muslims? Do you want Islam? Naturally, you know, our people are illiterate. They are simple folks, especially in the rural areas. People responded, yes. Okay, if you want Islam, then you elect me for another five years. He had been there seven years already. He took another five years by slate of hand. So he thought, then he went around telling everybody, all the foreign governments that were now starting to make noises that, you know, you've been a despot for so seven years. Mm -hmm. When are you going to have hold elections? So he said, okay, but the people of Pakistan want Islam. Ergo, they have voted me in for another five years. Because he used Islam as the plank and the platform for his illegal uh, military rule, therefore he brought in the religious political parties, which I will take great pride and pleasure in informing you and your audience the people of Pakistan, since we attained independence in 1947, had never, never, never given more than 2 to 3 percent of the popular vote in any free and fair general election. He brought them in through the back door. Because he was an illegal ruler, he didn't have any constituency, he made the pol religious political parties his constituency. And they backed him th through thick and thin to the hilt. How did they back him? There's always a quid pro quo. We will back you and your illegal military rule, but in return, the quid pro quo is that you start Islamization, so-called, and I always put Islamization in, in quotation. If this were a television interview, I would be raising my fingers in the quotation marks sign. Because what, what they promulgated was not Islam. You know, I am a secular person, and proudly and avowedly and openly so in a country which is the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, the constitution of which has the objectives resolution that all sovereignty lies with God and uh, uh, human beings are just the vicegerents of God on earth and that sort of thing. 
in such a country, I have the courage and the, without sounding overly immodest, the bravery to announce myself as openly secular. Now, even I can see the, even a secular person like me, you know, sees what, what is happening and they're saying that you Islamize the country by promulgating laws which we will draft as per a very, very, very retrogressive Saudi Wahhabi Deobandi. You know, Deobandi is a town in India which has a very famous religious school, very retrogressive, very orthodox. People are moving more to the right and not just to the right, it's a retrogressive kind of, you know, moving to the right is a right and left are Western terms in, in political terms. When we talk in religious terms, we can't simply talk right and left. It, these are lives of people we are dealing with. When you impose stoning to death for adultery and then equate rape with adultery so that a victim of rape is stoned to death for having committed adultery because she has um, admitted sexual intercourse has occurred, if she, if she goes to report rape, she is admitting that sexual intercourse between a man and a woman illegally has occurred. Now, I make you and I, being rational, reasonable human beings, would make a distinction between consensual relations and forced relations. Rape is forced relations and adultery is consensual relations. In a country where these mullahs who are so far right that they've lost all sense of rationality and reason and logic and, and sense and sensibility. And I will also take leave, David, to tell you that they have lost their humanity. A person like me who is secular still says that what they have promulgated during the Zia, dark days of the Zia era, was not Islamic. Nowhere in the Quran does it say that if a woman is caught in adultery, you shall stone her to death. It talks about a couple caught in adultery. And do you know what the Quranic punishment for adultery is? It is 100 lashes to each of the man and the woman and exile from Islamic lands. Not stoning to death for adultery. And rape is not mentioned in the Quran at all. There is no punishment to the victim for rape because it is not mentioned in the Quran. And a rapist is a criminal a civil, ordinary criminal who has attacked the person of, of another human being. And it, it, just like bodily assault, it should be tried in, in, the, in the law courts, which is what we believe. But when General Ziaul Haq promulgated the Hadood ordinances in 1979, he promulgated a number of ordinances. Hadood means limits in the Quran. There are certain limits set by the Quran. You know, like the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit murder, thou shalt not rob, thou shalt not, you know, this, that, and the other. It's similar to that, is in the Quran. When Ziaul Haq promulgated Sharia type punishments for Hadood ordinances, the one thing he did, he did a lot of wrong things, but the worst possible thing that he could have done wrong was the Zina ordinance. Zina is an Arabic word meaning adultery. And by the way, the law, all lawmaking was done by the, by the signature of a single individual. You know, there was no elected parliament as, as we just mentioned earlier. When he promulgated this law, it had in it a clause, several very, very, very uh, anti-people clauses and anti-women and anti-non-Muslim Pakistanis. I'd like to talk a little bit about that, if I may. The Zina ordinance provided that any couple caught in uh, extramarital sexual uh, intercourse shall be punished as if adultery has been committed and equated rape with adultery. So there's no recourse for rape victims. They dare not throughout that era and even subsequently because that statute is still on the law books. He gave, he gave indemnity to everything that he promulgated during his illegal 11-year rule by passing a constitutional amendment. So now it requires a constitutional amendment to undo what he has done. And from 1988 till now 2008, in 20 years, none of the elected governments in power has ever commanded a two-thirds majority to be able to overturn those, those constitutional amendments. But this time, this new government that has come in as a coalition partners does have two-thirds majority. So we are going to start pressing for these, for these amendments to be overturned. What I'd like to say here is that along with being very anti-women, the Hadood ordinances and the blasphemy law that General Ziaul Haq promulgated was extremely anti-Pakistanis who are non-Muslim. So that includes Christians, Hindus, Sikhs, 
Buddhists, Parsis, uh, Zoroastrians, Confucians, Taoists, uh, everybody, everybody who's not a Muslim. Another thing that was very dangerous was that because the, the support that he received from the religio-political parties was mainly from the majority Sunni, Hanafi, Deobandi sect, they were also very extremely anti-Shia. So there's a sectarian problem in Pakistan also. So now there's an anti-woman bias, an anti-non-Muslim Pakistani bias, citizens of Pakistan, and sadly also an anti-Shia bias and other sects. We have other minority sects also. And Shias make up about 20% of the population? A little less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are going in for a census this year, so we will find out exactly. But so now Shias feel themselves to be a threatened minority. Baha'is have been declared non-Muslims. Ahmadis have been declared non-Muslims. What are we left with? My goodness. You are anti-women, 48% of the population. You are anti-non-Muslims, that's between 5 and 10% of the population. You're anti-non-majority sect, Sunni, you know, anti... Uh, we are left with between 10 to 15% of the male, male Sunni Muslim Pakistanis. This country is being run for their benefit, by them, for them, and of them. Yeah. I, I really object to this very strongly, you know, such kinds of, 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 of biases and, and built-in uh, anomalies within the law, lawmaking process in Pakistan. And, and tell me briefly uh, if you could cover the areas of, of family laws, uh, divorce, uh, inheritance, uh, property rights, and women. I need to go back for a second. In this, under the Zina ordinance, where rape was equated with adultery, no non-Muslims were ever allowed to give testimony. So that, for example, if four male witnesses were required to witness the act of adultery or rape, Tell me which rapist is going to force a woman to be raped with four male Muslim witnesses watching silently as interested or disinterested spectators. I mean, for goodness sake, it also means that if 100 Christians, men or women, were to witness a Christian being raped or assaulted, they would not be able to give testimony. So women were not allowed to give testimony non-Muslim Pakistanis are not allowed to give testimony. And another very wrong thing that, has, that was under the Zina ordinance was that the age of puberty for girls, the age of majority for girls was puberty. Now, boys attain puberty much later than girls do in Pakistan because of our climate and because of our various other nutrition issues, etc., etc. Girls attain puberty very early, as early as 9 and 10. So a girl of 9 and 10 could be convicted and sentenced to death or life imprisonment or hard labor at the age of nine, if convicted, could be sentenced to death, could, could get maximum punishment. So this is a built-in bias against women and non-Muslims, which goes against the spirit and the words and the provisions and the guarantees of the 1973 constitution passed under Mr. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, which I will take leave to remind you, was unanimously passed in the elected parliament of 1973, including the religio-political parties, which included the four, I will use the word, the, the sexist word, forefathers. I will not say foremothers because there are no women in the, in the religious political parties who are allowed to attain, you know, head of party status or anything. They have just lower level cadres. So these men who are ruling, the, for example, the jamaat e islami the jamiyat ulama islam F-group, S-group, etc., etc., you know, the JUP, etc., all these uh, religio-political parties, they make up a rainbow coalition. Rainbow is too, uh, is, is being, uh, calling them a rainbow coalition is being unkind to rainbows. I love rainbows. So maybe I should not have used that word. Their forefathers in 1973 had unanimously endorsed the 1973 constitution, which is very, very progressive. It's pro-women, it's pro-non-Muslim minorities, it's pro-people, pro it's pro-labor, it's pro-peasants, it's pro-farmers uh, and agriculturists and, and the poor and the deprived sections of society. It provides for affirmative action for women, you know, in terms of livelihoods and, and, and opportunities and all that. It was such a good constitution, it's been mutilated beyond recognition now. We need to go back to that, to that constitution. While I'm praising the 1973 constitution, drafted and passed under the Zulfikar Ali Bhutto government. In 1961, 
we were also under another military dictator. It's surprising how, how Pakistan's history can be divided into chunks of military rule and chunks of non-military rule. As a result, again, I will not, you know, when people say that, I, I'm digressing, but I'm, I'm digressing to make a point. When Musharraf says that I have passed the Women's Protection Bill and I have done this and I have done, I have allowed, you know, when military dictators say to us, try to put us under an obligation or, or, or make us thank them or be grateful to them on bended knees that General Parvez Musharraf passed the uh, uh, Women's Protection Bill of 2007 or, you know, allowed so many private uh, television channels to operate. Excuse me! It is not out of the goodness of his heart or the magnanimity or the philanthropic spirit of any of these military dictators. These are hard-won rights and freedoms for which we have given our blood, sweat and tears. I was arrested this year. For, for my part in the, in the movement for the restoration of the judiciary and the freedom of the media, I was arrested. So many like me have been arrested as civil society. The, the media has struggled, the judiciary has struggled, civil society has struggled. These gains are hard won, hard fought for gains. It is not the magnanimity of anybody. Similarly, in 1961, when General Ayub Khan promulgated the Muslim Family Laws Ordinance, which is a fairly progressive, and considering the time, 61 so many years ago, you know, it was very progressive for its time, but we now, with hindsight, feel that we need to go beyond that. We need to strengthen the Muslim Family Laws Ordinance. We need to make it a little more secular. We need to bring into its ambit non-Muslim Pakistani women. You know, they are suffering under their own personal laws. The Hindu women suffer, the Christian women, especially, you pardon my saying so, Catholic women suffer a lot under their personal laws, which are in effect in Pakistan. Parsi women have come to us, um, uh, Hindu women have come to us, Sikh women have come to us as women's rights activists and say, please, why don't you get us the same family laws ordinance that, that the Muslim family laws ordinance came in 1961. What did that do? It did not so much seek to change, uh, make bring a revolutionary change. What it sought to do was to maybe bring limits to the unfettered rights of Muslim men as opposed to Muslim women. Let me give you an example. Muslim men throughout the past 14, 1500 years since the advent of Islam and, and the, the Quran have taken certain verses in the Quran to mean open uh, permission to marry up to four wives. That's polygamy. Muslim women do not have that uh, provision uh, uh, in, the, in the Quran. Now, what they don't realize is that the Quran has a proviso attached to that provision, which, uh, that, you know, that permission, which says that only if you are able to treat all four of them equally, if, but you will not, and the Quran also says, but you will not be able to do so because no one can treat four people equally, you know. Therefore, the Quran says, therefore it is better for you if you take only one. Now, all the Muslim men throughout the past 15 centuries have conveniently ignored the comma that, that followed that permission and have just taken the permission, open permission. So what the Muslim Family Laws of 1961 sought to do was to rein in that permission and not to make it such open permission. So they've sought to bring in the first wife's permission for a second marriage, the two, first two wives' permission for the third marriage, etc. And if they did not give their written consent, then the case would go to an arbitration council of the local government. If there was a local government uh, uh, sort of system in, in effect at that time, it would go to arbitration. So this was a kind of a, a small check. Another, another good thing was that all marriages had to be registered. Previously, they were just solemnized in a mosque by a Malvi, by a mullah, you know, by a, a clergyman, and nothing in paper, nothing on paper, nothing in writing. So the woman was, b women being economically dependent are somehow not in a bargaining or negotiating position on rights. So that is changing now in certain urban areas. People like me have the advantage of an education. We are economically independent. We are earning our own livelihoods. You know, I, I, I don't have to take permission from any man to do this, that, and the other. Now, at that time, of course, things were different, even in urban areas and, of course, in the rural areas, abject poverty. What that did was that if marriages are going to be registered and there is a piece of paper available with the woman and another piece of paper available with the man and another piece of paper, a copy of it available with 
the government of Pakistan, you know, it's the, it's the registration authority, marriages registration authority, the mullah who solemnizes the marriage signs it himself in the presence of witnesses from both sides and deposits that piece of paper. Now that is a little bit of some security, a little bit. Now the problem with all these laws is that they look so good on paper. The important point I'd like to come to is the implementation or the lack thereof. There is a lot of corruption in Pakistan. There's a lot of bribery. Because there's so much poverty, there's a lot of corruption. You know, poverty and corruption go hand in hand. Where government officials and the police are going to be so poorly paid, they will always, always, always take bribes. So any man who wants to marry two or three or four times bribes the police and marries, bribes the local government official and district government official and marries. Any father who does not want to give his daughter her share in inheritance of his property will write down certain things in his will before he dies and, and bribe the, the authorities. Fathers have been known to marry off their daughters to the Quran. It's like, it's almost like going into a nunnery. You know, it's almost like becoming a nun, you know, dedicating your life to God. Forcibly, nuns in, in the Catholic tradition do it on a volunteer basis. But Pakistani women who are forcibly married off to the Quran to prevent them from getting their inheritance are done so by their male relatives, their fathers and their brothers. You're listening to Tahira Abdullah on Pakistani women. This is AR. You can order copies of this program by calling our toll-free number 1-800-444-1977. That's 1-800-444-1977. Or you can order online on our website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. Now, let's just jump a little bit uh, to the end of the Zia al haq period in uh, 1988 when he is uh, killed in a yes. still yet uh, unsolved uh, plane crash. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the first uh, women prime minister in Pakistan in the Islamic world, uh, Benazir Bhutto, the daughter of uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she serves twice as Prime Minister of the country from 1988 to 1990, then again from 93 to 96. Were there expectations from uh, the women's movement here and other uh, elements of civil society that uh, Benazir Bhutto would uh, revoke or rescind the restrictive uh, Hudud ordinances? And, and what happened? I'm glad you've asked this question. It is a very, very important issue, and it is something that has been exercising the women's movement. We in the women's movement and the rights-based development movement have been worrying about this for a long time. The problem with Pakistan is that we are a nation of firsts, but no seconds. You know, first woman prime minister, Muslim countries, Muslim, the entire Muslim Omar, the first woman has been elected as the Speaker of the Parliament now. The first woman pilot, the first woman general in the army, the first this, the, that, and the other, you know, uh, uh, first woman cricketer. The first. We've had so many firsts. I'm sorry. It is a nation of 170 million people, 48% of whom are women living in abject deprivation and horrific living conditions. Who is thinking of them? When she became prime minister the first time, we went to her in a delegation and we said, please table a law to repeal these ordinances. We have taken advice from the highest constitutional authorities in the land and beyond the land, you know, from abroad. You do not need a two-thirds majority to repeal the Hadood ordinances. They are ordinances, they're not a constitutional amendment, but uh, her advisors, who wanted to stall the matter and put it on the back burner, kept telling her that these ordinances have been given indemnity by General Ziaul Haq under the Eighth Amendment that he passed in 1985, and therefore they fall under that indemnity, and therefore you need a two-thirds majority, which she never had. I will grant her, just to, just to be fair and not to sound biased, I will grant her that neither in her 88 government nor in her 1993 government did she ever command a two-thirds majority. She was always short of that. She, she, she had a simple majority, obviously, to, in order to form the government. 
but what I want to say here is, it's not so much what was done or not done, and it's not, by the way, it's not just the Hadood ordinances. The Evidence Act had to be repealed. The Kisas and Diyat Act have to be repealed. If we are ever going to tackle the horrific issue of honor killings and violence against women, we must get rid of the Kisas and Diyat law, which means uh, compensation and blood money for, for Bada. But what I'm trying to say is that it is a package deal. She has to get, she had to, she would have had to get rid of the Hadood ordinances, the Evidence Act, the Kisas and Diyat Act, and the Blasphemy Law, and the Sharia Act. So many things came in together that she would have had to get rid of. It became a towering mountain in front of her, and I think her advisors told her not to touch it with a barge pole, because if you recall that in both her governments, she had some elements of the religious political parties. So she's always had to, whether willingly or unwillingly, she's dead now, may God rest her soul in peace. She was in coalition with or at least had uh, in her aspects of her government, she had some of some some parts of the religious political parties were with her in each of her two governments, and now in in her, in her party's third government right now. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the Talibanization of uh, Pakistan, and um, uh, one of the great uh, intellectual activists of this country was uh, Akbal Ahmed, yes, and uh, before his death in 1999, uh, he expressed to me his worry and concern. Uh, about Pakistan moving more in the direction of uh, the Taliban, which is a notoriously uh, patriarchal, uh, misogynist uh, formation. He was someone we adored and looked up to as an icon. Yes, he was very prescient in his, in his early, almost like a premonition, like, like something he could see coming, you know, which people who have... Uh, vision and, and foresight can see things which the rest of us see only when it comes upon us or befalls us, he could see it coming. But what he couldn't have foreseen was that we would still be fighting as a frontline state post 9-11 and that, it, that Osama bin Laden would be seen or being alleged or accused by the US CIA to be hiding in the mountains on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. He, could, he probably would not have gone that far, and who could have imagined? But then the chickens have come home to roost. I think that the U.S. government is reaping now what it sowed from 1979. When it supported uh, many of the mujahideen elements right. which evolved into right. more extremist yes. uh, formations. Who are they? These Taliban are exactly those people. They are the... Uh, the, the blossoming flower, if you want to use that, that uh, horrible uh, metaphor, if one wants to, they have, this is what, this is what those, those chickens have come home to roost now. Tell me about um, women and, and the arts, music, uh, poetry, uh, dance, uh, and the like. What, what role do women play in the arts in Pakistan? Um, there are two ways to answer this question. We in South Asia have a very rich cultural legacy, very, very rich. We go back to the Indus Valley civilization. We go back to the, to the uh, uh, Harappa civilization, you know, um, Mohenjo Daro, etc. All these things are well known. 10,000 years of civilization, which includes culture and the fine arts, music, singing, dancing, sculpture, painting, poetry, literature. We have all of that and we have recorded history from the last 10,000 years. The latest, of course, being the Mehrgar finds in Balochistan. Unfortunately, the encounter between Islam and Hinduism in the South Asian subcontinent, which used to be called the Indian subcontinent, now it's called the South Asian subcontinent, was not that happy an encounter. Islamic hardliners and um, the Orthodox frowned upon depiction of the human form in any way. Uh, whether in painting or in sculpture or any other form. They also frowned upon music and dancing and singing and poetry. But, but somehow, because of our uh, very close relations with our Hindu neighbors in the South Asian subcontinent, they could not kill us off entirely. You know, this, this frowning down upon and the, the lack of encouragement of and promotion of, despite all of that, it has not managed to kill off arts and culture. So it survives to this day, but does not have much state, state patronage 
and therefore there is not that much promotion for example singing and dancing and music and etc and, and art and, and sculpture is not taught as a school curriculum you have to go into specialized schools which don't have so much funding grants from either the government or from the private sector so it is in a state of decay but despite all this i would like to accord and record my admiration and absolute acknowledgement of the bravery and the courage of our poets our singers our dancers our musicians our painters who carried on during the the very very brutal repressive regime of general ziaullah with all these art forms and in fact have produced masterpieces of protest protest art and culture one of the principal tropes of uh, western reporting on pakistan uh, inevitably focuses on uh, honor killings i believe it's called karokari a karokari is the name given in sindh it's called various uh, by various names in various other other parts of pakistan um it is a huge issue there are different types of violence there's domestic violence in the home whether in in a girl's father's home or in her husband's home there are different issues of violence against women violence against women is domestic violence against women public violence against women and state violence against women so we we can divide it up into three we don't have the time to go into each of the categories let me just talk about public violence again public sanctioned here i'd like to bring in the issue of panchayats and jirgas this is an illegal parallel system of justice administration by self appointed men only men who belong to, who are either tribal chiefs or feudal landlords they are not elected people they are not appointed by the state to be judges or or anything they are self appointed the former council a village council called a jirga or a panchayat in the tribal areas and in the uh, pakhtunkhwa and balochistan areas they are called jirgas and in punjab and sindh they are called panchayats these are absolutely patriarchal anti women anti people uh, group of old rich feudal tribal chiefs they give judgments on all kinds of disputes and for conflict resolution women are used either as exchange in marriages or to to be sent in exchange as compensation for murders or for property disputes or water disputes or any kind of disputes or honor disputes the women are used as the commodity of exchange and even death women are killed off in order to settle disputes between male warring feudal families or tribes or all sorts of of things it is barbaric it is absolutely unheard of there are almost 2000 honor killings in pakistan per year which is just the tip of the iceberg that is reported the rest are all unreported and as far as domestic violence goes it is it is it has been surveys have been done research has been carried out more than 85% of pakistani women are victims of violence and abuse in the home whether in their father's home or in their husband's home more than 85% do you know a report was done in collaboration with a foreign research agency and a pakistani research agency got together did a huge nationwide survey a representative sample was selected and the findings were so explosive that the government of pakistan is not allowing that report to be publicized since 2002 6 years that report has lain in cold storage it is not allowed to be published because the donor agency was the british government and the british government had an agreement with the government of pakistan that their approval would be taken before publicizing the findings of that private sector research and it has not been publicized because of the explosive findings of violence against women in pakistan you're an urban based uh, well educated woman how do you reach out to people in the rural areas i mean you have many advantages and privileges i'm glad you asked that um i first started my volunteer work in the rural areas in 1973 when i was just 20 years old in 73 i started my my rural work uh in terms of disaster disaster relief and i have not looked back since i've traveled all four provinces and the northern areas and the tribal areas of pakistan and i make it my business to work with small community groups 
and with those non-government organizations, which I believe you in the states call private non-voluntary, private not-for-profit organizations, NGO. NGOs. We call them NGOs, non-government organizations, and there are many people like me doing the same thing. Urban, privileged, educated people who have the advantages that our rural sisters don't have. We use community-based organizations and non-government organizations to access the rural women and the deprived and marginalized sectors, even of urban society. What is the state of the women's movement here? The women's movement is not a homogenous entity, just like the women are not. Um, there are those women who, for whom it is not a problem to gather, to muster the strength and the courage and the bravery to go out on the streets and demonstrate and rally for our rights. I am one of those. Then there are those who feel that providing service delivery to those who don't have access to health and education and microcredit and employment and livelihoods and, and you know training, vocational skills training, etc., is also women's development and is also part of the women's movement. They do that work. And then there are those who feel that going to the rural areas and trying to uh, motivate women to take part in local government, you know, to vote in the local government elections, to vote in the general elections. Political participation, mobilization is also a form of the women's movement. So there, it takes many forms and many shapes. And, and uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, I'm happy. And can you recommend some resources uh, and or websites uh, so people could learn more about these different movements inside of Pakistan? Yes. There's www.af.org, A-F-A as in apple, F as in frank, dot O-R-G, dot P-K, P as in Pakistan, K as in Karachi. Why don't you give that one more time? Uh, okay. A as in apple, F as in frank, dot O-R-G, dot P as in Pakistan, K as in king. AF stands for Aurat Foundation, which is Women's Foundation. That's just one. We have hundreds of women's organizations in Pakistan, all of them doing excellent work. I'd just like to say one thing. Our women's movement is an indigenous movement. While we welcome speaking out from other parts of the world, including the United States of America, from the women's movement of the United States and the civil liberties movement and the rights-based organization, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, International Crisis Group, etc., etc., etc. While we welcome their speaking out, we feel that they speak out against our government. Fine, we are already doing that. I want them to speak out against their government, you know, propping up and siding with and being so much in favor of our military dictatorships. The war against the Soviet Union in uh, Afghanistan uh, fought via Pakistan, uh, as you mentioned, created a huge refugee problem uh, in this country. Uh, to this day, unknown numbers, perhaps several million Afghans, still live uh, in the country, many of whom are women. Can you talk about their situation? In fact, most of whom are women, because the men went off to fight the jihad, remember? And some of them stayed on, some of, most of them got killed, many of them went abroad in search of livelihoods, so most of them are women and children, or elderly folk, you know, the, the grandparents. They live a life of abject misery and deprivation, despite the fact that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the related bodies, the World Food Program, etc., etc., are taking care of them and have been taking care of them, and the government of Pakistan have been, have been taking care of them, but still, you know, living like refugees. Um, there are two aspects to this. One, they were resented by the populations in the border areas where they came, which was Pakhtunkhwa province, the northwest frontier, and Balochistan province, because they came and displaced the local populations, especially in the rural areas where their livestock came and took away the pasture lands and the very scarce drinking water. Water has always been scarce in Balochistan and Pakhtunkhwa. So initially there was a lot of resentment, but slowly they started you know, melding in and, and be became more of a melting pot. Um, they have taken over a lot of the transport and the trucking industry. They've taken a lot of, uh, uh, over a lot of the businesses and commerce, etc., etc. Some of them are doing well in the large cities, but in the camps, they are not doing well at all. 
Many of them hesitate to go back to Afghanistan because of the horrible security situation post 9-11. You know, the, uh, the US invaded Afghanistan and this, the ISAF and the NATO forces are still there fighting a, a losing battle and, and a lo lost war already. So the plight of the women is very bad. It was very bad under the Taliban inside Afghanistan. It was not equally bad in Pakistan and Iran as refugees, but still living in tents for, for 30 years is not a happy situation. So they're in a, in a situation between a rock and a hard place, basically. One of the great poets of uh, Pakistan is Faiz Ahmed Faiz, who died in uh, 1984. Uh, here in, this, in, in Islamabad, I... Um, saw this uh, particular poster, uh, which was to celebrate and honor um, International uh, Women's Day. And it, it's uh, one of Faiz Ahmed Faiz's uh, most famous poems called Bol, which means speak. So I'm going to ask you uh, if you would maybe read the Urdu and then the, um, the English translation, just to give um, you know, people a flavor of the language, but also the politics of Faiz Ahmed Faiz. And by the way, it is equally applicable to women's rights activists as it is to all male, male activists for all rights, all human rights. And those who protest against unjust rule and especially dictate military dictatorships which seek to silence all protest. And I, I, I recited this while I was, when I was arrested, you know, I recited this also. Bol, bol ke lab azad hai tere. Bol zaba ab tak teri hai. Tera sotwa jism hai tera. Bol ke jaan ab tak teri hai. Dekh ke ahan gar ki dukame. Tund hai shole, surkh hai ahan. Khulne lage qaflon ke dhane. Phela har ek zanjeer ka daman. Bol ye thoda vakt pohot hai. Jism o zaba ki maut se pehle. Bol ke sach zinda hai ab tak. Bol jo kuch kehna hai kehle. The English translation goes, Speak, that is the title, Speak. Speak, your lips are free. Speak, your tongue is still yours. This magnificent body is still yours. Speak, your life is is still yours. Look inside the smithy, leaping flames, red hot iron, padlocks open wide their jaws, chains disintegrate. Speak. There is little time, but little though it is, it is enough. Time enough before the body perishes, before the tongue atrophies. Speak. The truth still lives. Say what you have to say. Speak. Your lips are free. Thank you very much for your You're time. You're most welcome. Pleasure being here with you. That was Tahira Abdullah on Pakistani women. I talked with her in Islamabad in April 2008. Tahira Abdullah is a prominent women's rights activist and development worker based in Islamabad. This program is produced by Alternative Radio, an unembedded award-winning weekly series based in Boulder, Colorado. Since we began broadcasting in 1986, we've always offered AR free to all public and community radio stations in the United States and the rest of the world. We are independent. Our sole source of financial support comes directly from listeners just like you. AR features such voices as Fatima Bhutto, Rahimullah Yusufzai, Tariq Ali, Ahmed Rashid, Arundhati Roy, Noam Chomsky, Vandana Shiva, Howard Zinn, and Naomi Klein. To access our vast audio catalog and to find out about subscribing to AR so you don't miss a single program, we offer CD, printed transcript, and MP3 subscriptions, go to our website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. To place a credit card order for a CD, MP3, or written transcript of the program you just heard, Tahira Abdullah on Pakistani Women, call us toll-free at 1-800-444-1977. Again, that toll-free number is one 800 
444-1977. Or you can order on our secure website, alternativeradio.org. That's alternativeradio.org. Series theme music is performed by the Kronos Quartet from Pieces of Africa. Ali Lightfoot is our editor. I'm David Barsamyan. Thank you for listening. We go out with Iqbal Bano of Pakistan singing a ghazal, a love poem in Urdu, dasht e tanhaime written by Pakistan's great poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz. <laughs> Shabnam, dashte tanha.